Alright. Yeah, this kind of hit my radar quite a while ago, but to be honest, I'm a, do you know what I mean? All these proper gruesome things, a lot of the times I just don't want to hear it. Now, I don't mind the ghost, do you know what I mean? But, yeah. Unit 731, which was Japanese, I think, prisoners of war. Which, I'm pretty sure my great uncle was a prisoner of war in to the Japanese. He was prisoner, yeah, definitely Japanese. And yeah, my dad said he never, ever spoke about it. So whatever happened to him in there, he took it to his grave. But yeah, yeah, let's go. Four to six weeks. It's a duration of time that you and I probably take for granted. What can really happen in that time? Nothing, right? Maybe that's a big project at work, or maybe how long you'd spend learning integrals in calculus. I'll tell you what can happen. Nala can get bigger and way more, I'll tell ya. <clears throat> in a different perspective, that is precisely the duration of time that Chinese, Korean, Mongolian, and Russian people in regions around Northeast China had after they were picked up by the Imperial Japanese Army for no apparent reason in the mid-1930s to mid-1940s. If only they knew what they were actually being picked up for was to be shipped off to a place called Harbin, a district in Manchuria of Japan at the time. The compound they were headed to had the rather innocent name, Army Epidemic Prevention Research Laboratory. The place they were actually headed to had no epidemic prevention lab. This was nothing good-willed at all. Far from it. Right when they got into that windowless van, their identities had changed from whoever they were to a number, a few digits, a specimen. And as soon as they got off, well, they would never see their loved ones again. And thus ensued some of the most gruesome human experiments ever to have occurred in the name of war, or worse yet, science. But the human body well, it can only endure so much. Nobody who was shipped off to this place lived for more than four to six weeks after being taken. Four to six weeks. This is the story of Unit 731. Well, let's go. The unit was built as a hub for chemical warfare research, inspired by the Nazis and their use of chemical weapons. Surgeon General of the Imperial <laughs> Japanese Army, Shiro Ishii, had taken a few trips abroad, which had sowed the idea into his demented head before finally bringing it to the attention with a secret group of high-ranking Japanese officials. Initially scattered across different parts of Japan, the unit finally came together under one roof that would finally get the name of the Epidemic Prevention Center. People were that seemingly picked at cool. random from Chinese streets. There were men of all ages, women, and even babies. While the overwhelming majority of the victims of Unit 731 were Chinese, they also comprised Koreans, Mongolians, Russians, and some Westerners as well. Basically, anyone they could get their hands on. After the initial shock that most of the prisoners had suffered from being brought into such a place, surprisingly, they were actually fed quite well for the first few days. Don't mistake this as a gesture of kindness. In the minds of Shiro Ishii, this wasn't anything remotely close to that. It was simply to ensure that his precious test subjects were in an ideal state of health before the experiments began. The element of deception was interwoven into every facet of Unit 731, and it began with their very first meal on the very first day. In fact, Unit 731 couldn't care less about its victims beyond their usefulness for their research. Most notably, they weren't even referred to as humans, or even subjects. Within the unit staff, they were simply Maruta, or logs. The dehumanization began at the gate. When the grace period, or so to speak, was finally over, the experimentation could begin. This includes everything from infecting people with the bubonic plague, syphilis, to amputating limbs from one side of the body and reattaching them on the other. Not to get into the religious science debate, but when people say no one's ever killed anybody because of atheism, well, you can argue that science is the body of atheists, the body of work of atheists, and a lot of people have died to 
advanced things in science. Do you know what I mean? Or people taking pills to make their head blow up or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like crazy experimental. Just, yeah. But there's an answer right there for <clears throat> when people say that atheism's not killed no one. Because it's true. If you are an atheist and you believe that everything is just cellular, cell, cell, cellular formulas and you're nothing but kind of your genetics and your what, do you know what I mean? You're all just programmed monkeys, then what does it matter? Ripping someone apart while they're alive or whatever, do you know what I mean? But yeah, let's go. Simply to see what would happen. Other tests included testing the methods to treat shrapnel wounds by first tying people to a post and then detonating an explosive in close proximity. In the movie Unit 731, Nights in Manchuria, it was said, To determine the best course of treatment for varying degrees of shrapnel wounds sustained on the field by Japanese soldiers, Chinese prisoners were exposed to direct bomb blasts. They were strapped, unprotected, to wooden planks that were staked into the ground at increasing distances around a bomb that was then detonated. It was surgery for most, autopsies for the rest. It is to be noted that none of these surgeries or experimentations were done under anesthesia. In typical demented Shiro Ishii fashion, the reasoning for this was that they weren't sure if the anesthesia would have a co-founding effect on the wounds or how they healed. After the initial bouts of screams, most of the victims just laid there, waiting to bleed to death. There are other numerous accounts of vivisections, or experimentation on live humans. It was so routine that they would go through the numerous bodies just for practice. Then there was the fascination with infectious diseases and their wartime applications. People would be infected left, right, and center with venereal diseases, and would then be forced to transmit those diseases amongst the other prisoners around. Babies were also said to have been born during the Unit 731 experiments, but I think you and I both know that many of them never got to see the light of day. Another relatively more known experiment of Unit 731 were the tests conducted to treat frostbite. Given the possibility of a war with the Soviets, the Japanese army wanted to know how their soldiers would fare in the sub-zero temperatures in the event of frostbite and how best to treat them. To do so, however, they would first artificially induce frostbite in people by taking them outside in the freezing cold and splashing water onto their tied hands until they froze. Guards would then strike their arms literally to see what sound they made. If they sounded like wood, they knew they had frostbite. The victims would then be brought in for a plethora of treatments to try on them. Sometimes their limbs would be submerged in the liquids at well over boiling temperatures. A similar slew of experiments followed for extreme heat. They conducted experiments where participants would be forced to stay inside rooms with temperatures nearing boiling point, all to see how long a human could survive, and how quickly the water in their bodies would evaporate. Then there were experiments to see how humans would fare against different chemical agents, in case it wasn't already clear from the Nazis. The lab was just the major military establishment to house all of this. That is not to say that the unit did not have a presence elsewhere. In fact, Unit 731 is said to have had branches as far as Singapore and Beijing. Besides, viruses and bacteria developed within the facilities of Unit 731 were then tested in parts of China as well. Troops from the unit were said to offer candies laced with anthrax to kids in China, all while guising it as an act of kindness. They would also offer injections of infectious diseases in the name of preventative vaccinations. At the same time, they managed to create flies to spread the bubonic plague. Low flying planes carrying buckets of these flies would drop them into parts of China. And just days later, people would start perishing before the eyes of their loved ones for no apparent reason. They would also infect agriculture and water systems of these cities to examine how much of the population it would affect. Just these acts alone are said to have taken 400,000 Chinese lives. The biological warfare unit was so prolific that the logs would report bacteria quantities in kilograms, not grams, which is how it's used in pretty much every other bio lab in the world. That should give you a sense of the scale at which they were operating. Reports suggest that the biological ammunition that Unit 731 possessed in its heyday 
was enough to destroy our current world's population many times over. A single death is a tragedy. A million is... It is mental, but also, like, it is fascinating. Because, like, they're kind of, like, actually testing things that you talk about as kids in kind of, do you know what I mean, Gan? What would you rather do? Freeze to death or burn to death? And, like, these guys are like, no, let's actually find out what happens. Do you know what I mean? Mental. But, again, it is fascinating. As awful as it is, it's fascinating. But, yeah, let's go. And that's true. What you just said there. A single death is a tragedy. A million is a, is a st statistic. But yeah, let's go. Statistic. <laughs> it's a quote that's been used a lot in the past 18 months due to the pandemic. In Unit 731's case, one could make a similar argument. To Shiro Ishii, even a million lives wouldn't have truly registered. What mattered was how much data he had, and how much more he needed. This operation of the Imperial Army was so massive that they simply had lost all sense of value for human life that wasn't their own. In their own twisted way, the staff of Unit 731 justified their activities to their conscience by saying that they would have killed people in the battlefield anyways, so they might as well do it in the name of science. But even that wasn't entirely true. It was noted that a lot of the experiments the people in the unit were doing had no seeming scientific benefit. For example, they were injecting victims with blood from monkeys just to see how they would react. A professor at Osaka University who studied the unit's activities including watching footage had the following to say. Some of the experiments had nothing to do with advancing the capability of germ warfare, or of medicine. There is such a thing as professional curiosity. What would happen if we did such and such? Well, that's what, I'm saying. what medical purpose was served by performing and studying beheadings? None at all. That was just playing around. Professional people, too, like to play. They were yeah. simply doing them to soothe the demented impulse in them that one may call curiosity. These were psychopaths with power unlike anything they had ever experienced. Every rule has an exception. You know how people always say curiosity should know no bounds? <laughs> well, this is that exception. Of course, these are just some of the experiments. Well, the truth is, to be fair, like I said, there's nothing wrong with pondering. It's like I say, that is something you think. Like, what do you think happens if you if you just get like put in oil and water? How long do you reckon you'll last? Like, there's nothing wrong with curiously, like being curious about something like that. But there, there. It's the same as anything like that. There's nothing wrong with thinking anything, but there is wrong when you actually start to act it out and actually start to try and find answers for these questions. Uh, these are the type of questions that you kind of say when you're having some weird, deep conversation. You go, imagine, or not even, just like someone might throw it. Like I say, what would you rather do? Freeze to death or burn to death? Like, what's better? Like... Or would you rather starve to death or be stuffed until you burst? Like, especially among men, them sort of questions come up all the time. Because, yeah, you just kind of hypothetically, we, we live in the hypothetical world as men. Or would you rather fight a giant ant or a giant tarantula? Do you know what I mean? just things like that but you never actually think right now I'm actually gonna like try and find some answers to this stuff you just go you have the conversation and then that's it some of the details are just so gruesome that I decided to not even mention them even the ones I mentioned are probably enough for this video to get restricted and that's okay because this is a discussion worth having these and other experiments have taken the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Lower bound estimates of the death toll from Unit 731 and its activities are somewhere around half a million. Now, I'm not one to compare atrocities, 
but it does seem a bit odd to me that people know about the Guantanamo Bays of the world, but not about Unit 731. Of course, that was until I found out that it's no accident that that's the case. Once Japan's surrender was imminent, the United States wanted full access to research documents of Unit 731. They even threatened the Japanese with involving the Soviets in their trial, which would complicate things for Shiro Ishii and his staff given many of Unit 731's victims were Russians. They were fearful of a trial under the war crimes law under the Soviets, and decided to strike a deal for complete immunity from all charges in exchange for the documents with the United States. The United States, on the other hand, wanted to ensure that these documents did not find their own to either their adversaries or even their allies. And in a singular bid to get the documents, they accepted the deal. Because of this, most members of Unit 731 were allowed to walk out and live their lives to their natural deaths scot-free, and some were even paid hefty sums along with their immunity for the documents. These people were literally paid for doing all of these terrible things to their fellow human beings, and this is probably the first time you're hearing of it. The United States maintains official silence over the unit to this day, and dismissed some of the early claims about the unit as communist propaganda. Many of the unit staff opened clinics later in life and went on to have very successful careers. Justice was certainly not served. Now, whether what the United States did was right or wrong, I'll let you decide. But what they essentially said to the rest of the world is this. The United States of America is ready to overlook even the most horrific violations of human rights if it is advantageous to do so. It is only relatively recently that the Japanese government even acknowledged the existence of this unit. Because of the deal with the United States government, most of the documents about the unit never really made it to the public, and all but a handful of its staff remain alive. How they managed to get so many people to hate the others so much that it didn't bother them to gas mothers and their infants, let alone do the plethora of other heinous things that I just mentioned, is astonishing. Every member of the unit who was asked why they had done what they did had precisely the same type of reply that you would expect. I was ordered. Yeah. Yeah, but that's what that book's about, isn't it? Ordinary Men, which I'm, I do want to actually read or yeah, listen to the audio book of that, and it's about, yeah, Nazis. How, like, say, police officers who were, like, in their 30s when Hitler came around. So people that didn't grow up in like Hitler youth and that, do you know what I mean? They wasn't they would they had already had their world view before Hitler came along, do you know what I mean? But this book Ordinary Men talks of how these men that were like police officers were regular people and then transformed into someone who could shoot a pregnant mother on their hands and knees. Do you know what I mean? A pregnant woman on her hands and knees. Do you know what I mean? Just execute her without a second thought. But it like... Again, I got this from Jordan Peterson. That's why I want to read the book. But it's already from the sound of that, you know it's going to be heavy. But it talks of like a lot of things like say for the like the police that was brought over to I think it was the I don't know, Poland somewhere. They was taken to Poland to police the streets and then it, it starts slowly. So you don't just take these people and make them execute a pregnant woman straight away. And also they're told that any time they can leave. And as things get worse and worse and worse, they slowly, gradually get worse and worse and worse. And apparently in his book, it talks about how these men were physically sick. But then, like, things like... Um, sticking by your men. Do you know what I mean? Like, things like that start to play into it, where... You don't want to leave behind your brothers in arms, I suppose. And there's a loyalty to there. And and it basically talks of how these regular German men turn into, 
yeah, the type of person who can execute a pregnant mother. And what's scary is that it's kind of in every human. If it can happen to them, it can 100% happen to you. And it can happen to me. Where you can be... Um, Either manipulated or transformed into something you don't want to be, but you do it because you do it willingly, but you do it not willingly. It, do you know what I mean? That's a very psychological game you're playing with someone. And yeah. Anyway, I advise reading that book. But and also, the thing is, as well, I saw a journalist, him saying, like, keeping it quiet. I saw a journalist give the best. Because I got madly into the paedophile ring of the elite in this country. And these police officers talking about it and whatever. And a journalist who was kind of trying his best to expose it. But he, this journalist who's gone through hell from the media. But he kind of defended the media in terms of covering up horrendous things. He's like, he doesn't, he's like he doesn't see it necessarily that they're covering it up but at the end of the day they're trying to sell a newspaper that people are going to read like eating their breakfast in the morning so you, they don't really want to put in these horrendous things to shock some old woman do you know what I mean they are trying to sell the paper and I actually thought that's a good fair way of looking at it but the truth of that is that whether it's on purpose or not you're still covering things like this up if you know about it and don't talk about it yeah crazy it's man to like ability to harm each other you know then I suppose it's, it's, it's the arrogance to humans to think that we're any better than that anyway. Because animals do it. Not quite like that, do you know what I mean? But that's only because they haven't quite got the um, brain power to do experiments. Because they're just, yeah, they're animals. But we ain't that different. Alright, we can kind of rationalise and... To think we're above, like, everything on this planet fights and goes to war with another part. If you stand there and you look at a nice peaceful field and you look at it and you think, oh, that's all nice and calm. Beneath that soil, things is killing each other. There's bacteria killing each other. Like, there's destruction and death within that soil. And you look out at the sea and you go, oh, that's nice. There's things getting ripped apart and killed every single day in this sea. Like, So I don't know why humans... I, well, I do think we are better than that. But I think our inability to actually address that and that kind of violence and war, if you like, or at least violence, is kind of part of this world too. Do you know what I mean? You hear thunder is because hot air and cold air has collided. Uh, like, do you know what I mean? It's like in everything there's a... Yeah. Well, I do think we could be better than it, but I don't think we're ever going to be better than it as long as we keep thinking we're better than it already. Because we're not. But yeah, anyway, this was crazy. And crazy that it's not bigger news, like of how much you learn about the concentration camps. Like I say, but my uncle was in, was well, my great uncle um, was in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. And like I say, he never spoke about what he saw or what happened. Do you know what I mean? I think sometimes people... It's like the Sopranos, isn't it? What happened to the old school man that, do you know what I mean? 
you didn't hear him whining and complaining. Then I suppose is it? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, that's the reaction. Let me know your thoughts. But yeah, sweet.